Happy Lord's Day. Good to see you all this morning. Welcome to our visitors that are here uh, with us. We're, we're thrilled that you are here to worship God uh, with us today. Um, it's also a great privilege of ours to have Pastor Ari Van Eyck uh, joining us, and he will be delivering the morning and the evening sermon to us today as Pastor Zeki is switching pulpits with Pastor Ari today. And so Zeki is up in Greensboro, um, North Carolina at Providence OPC, and Pastor Ari Van Eyck is here with us today. So be sure to, to greet him, and uh, we're very thankful that he is here. A few announcements before the worship service begins this morning. Uh, ladies, please note that uh, tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock p.m. at the Schindler's House will be the, um, the, the resuming of the Women's Fellowship time and book study. And um, Jenny Ortega uh, mentioned that she'll be here tonight with extra books. If you need a copy of the book, she'll have it tonight. Um, so please, uh, if you need it, see Jenny this evening. Um, 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, Wednesday, we have our uh, regular weekly uh, Bible study and prayer time together. You can uh, attend at the church, uh, or you can also join via Zoom. Um, and then please remember that next Lord's Day morning, um, Daniel Schindler will uh, be ordained as a deacon. We praise God for that. Please be in prayer for him. And then that's why we don't have our fellowship lunch today. We're going to have our fellowship lunch next week so that we can uh, fellowship together after the ordination of a new deacon. And then finally, um, or two final announcements, um, the, the Lord's Supper is going to be moved from next Sunday morning, the 20th, to the following Sunday morning, the 27th. So please note that Lord's Supper on the 27th. And then the final announcement um, is just a, a reminder that uh, Pastor Zeki has counseling hours here at the church at his office Thursdays from 2.30 to 5 o'clock. So please keep these announcements in mind, and let's now prepare ourselves to worship God with silent prayer. of Christ Jesus. Let's rise as our God calls us into his blessed presence this morning with the words of Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have ex executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been called into the worship of our great God, and now our Lord Jesus Christ himself greets you. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us worship and raise our voices and praise of our great God. Selection number two, O worship the King.
Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Our Father and our God, we gather before you this morning, giving all praise to your name, for you alone, O Lord, are worthy of blessing and honor, of glory and power and might, now and forever. We ask our Father tonight, today, that you would please send your spirit among your people, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth, that we might delight ourselves in the Lord our God and in Jesus Christ, our Savior, that we might ride upon the high places of the earth, that we might be fed with the inheritance of Jacob, our Father, for you, O Lord, by your mouth have spoken it. So we ask, O Lord, that as you have said, so you would do today among your people, and that all glory would be given to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, our one triune God, now and forevermore. Amen. Our confession of faith this morning will come from the Shorter Catechism, questions 98 and 99, which can be found in the back of your hymnal on page 877. Page 877, questions 98 and 99. I will ask the question and we will respond in unison with the answer, having to do with prayer. Question number 98. What is prayer? Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. What rule hath God given for our direction in prayer? The whole word of God is of use to direct us in prayer. But the special rule of direction is that form of prayer which Christ taught his disciples, commonly called the Lord's Prayer. Amen. The revelation of God's law this, this morning will come from Isaiah chapter 38. Isaiah 38, you can find this on page 761 if you're reading from your pew Bible this morning. We'll begin in verse 9 and read through verse 20. Isaiah 38, beginning at verse 9, remember that this is the infallible and inerrant word of God. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness. I said in the middle of my days, I must depart. I am consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of my years. I said, I shall not see the Lord the Lord in the land of the living. I shall look no man no more among the inhabitants of the world. My dwelling is plucked up and removed from me like a shepherd's tent. Like a weaver I have rolled up my life. He cuts me off from the loom. From day to night you bring me to an end. I calmed myself until morning. Like a lion he breaks all my bones. From day to night you bring me to an end. Like a swallow or a crane I chirp. I moan like a dove. My eyes are weary with looking upward. O oh Lord, I am oppressed. Be my pledge of safety. What shall I say? For he has spoken to me, and he himself has done it. I walk slowly all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. O oh Lord, by these things men live, and in all these is the life of my spirit. O oh, restore me to health and make me live Behold, it was for my welfare that I had great bitterness. But in love you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. For Sheol does not thank you, death does not praise you. Those who go down to the pit do not hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living, he thanks you, as I do this day. The Father makes known to the children your faithfulness. The Lord will save me. And we will play my music on stringed instruments all the days of our lives at the house of the Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. You may be seated. As we have read the glorious word of God 
We see how far short of God's glory that we come, and it is altogether proper for us to confess our sins before the Lord. And so we will confess our sins this morning using the prayer that is in your bulletin insert um, that you have with you. And we will pray together in unison this prayer of confession of our sins before the Lord our God. Let us now pray. We have sinned against you, O Lord, our Maker, our Defender, and our Redeemer. Our natures are corrupt and sinful, prone to fall away from you, sluggish to do good and swift to do evil. Vain thoughts have come upon us and found lodging within us, defiling and disquieting our minds and keeping out good thoughts. We have burdened ourselves with that care which you have commanded us to cast upon you. We have failed in our duties one to another and have provoked one another as much to folly and anger as to love and good works. We have been cold in our love to you, weak in our desires toward you, unsteady in our walking with you, and are even at this time poorly prepared to serve you. We beseech you, forgive all our sins for Christ's sake, and be at peace with us in him who died to make peace and lives to make intercession for us. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have this great assurance given in God's word from Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12, to those that confess their sins from their heart before the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Praise be to the Lord. Let's sing our hymn of praise this morning, even as we take up the morning offering with hymn number 80.
Amen. Let us go now to the Lord our God in prayer, and even as we confessed earlier, we will close the pastoral prayer by, in unison, going into the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we come before your powerful and mighty throne through Jesus Christ, our Savior, even as you have given us the power to do so through your Holy Spirit. And we come before you, O God, for you and you alone are our Lord. You alone are our light and our salvation so that we shall fear no other. You are the stronghold of our life so that we are never afraid. We praise you, O God, that you have given us this great gift of drawing together as your people in worship to lift high our prayers, our petitions, our praises, our thanksgivings, even before you. We ask, O Lord, that you would hear from heaven, send now among us and save us. Help us, O Lord, in all of our needs that we bring before you this morning. Our Father, we ask that you would please bless this church that you have established here in Atlanta, and your church that you have established throughout all nations. We thank you, O Lord, that you are going forth and conquering, that every tower and fortress of Satan is crumbling, and that the word of God is going forth with great power and success. We ask, O Lord, that you would remove all hindrances to your gospel, that you would remove all hindrances to your church, that you would break down and destroy those governments that would seek to persecute your people, that would block missionaries from entering, that would bring shame to the name of Christ Jesus. And we ask, O Lord, that your, your word and your spirit might go forth to every land, nation, tribe, and tongue. So, O Lord, we remember this morning our missionaries that are scattered throughout the world, faithful missionaries of the gospel, and we ask, Lord, that you would bless their labors for your glory, that you would give them boldness and confidence from on high, that they might not fear or be timid in their glorious message, but that they might go forth declaring the glory of God the Son to all nations, peoples, tribes, and languages, and they might have great success. That those countries where there are no established churches, there might be great churches, strongholds of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where they themselves might go in years to come and send forth missionaries to other lands. We remember, O oh Lord, this morning, those countries of Russia and Ukraine that are currently at war with one another. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would cause this war to cease, that the Russian army would return to Russia, that you would give, uh, that you would give your people in Ukraine strength in bearing witness to the glory of God even in time of war and that they might not fear or be afraid, for you are with them, and you will comfort them. We ask, Lord, that you would use this great time of turmoil when lives are upended and uprooted and people are fleeing for their lives across nations, that you, O Lord, would cause your people to be there with the glorious light of Christ, and that people might turn from those things that are fleeting and fading away, even houses and money and wealth and safety, all those things that we put so much stock in. O Lord, we ask that you would cause all who hear the word to take their encouragement from God only, and to put their trust in Jesus Christ only in this life and for the life to come. We ask, O Lord, that you would keep your people safe. We ask, O Lord, that you would cause many to come to you in this hour of turmoil. O oh Lord, we ask for the church in this land that you would cause your word to abide and that it would be strengthened, that you would reform your churches, that you would bring revivals to our states and even throughout our whole country, that all those things that are called gospels but are no good news at all would cease, that every synagogue of Satan would be destroyed, that truth, the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and your word of truth would prevail and would be that which all men and women, boys and girls, put their trust in. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would cause those faithful churches around the country to be filled, filled to capacity with worshipers seeking to worship you in spirit and in truth. We remember this morning our own church, but also Providence OPC in Greensboro, North Carolina, that you would be with these two churches this morning that you would cause them to grow stronger in the faith, that you would cause them to 
gain in membership, that many visitors would come in, hear the glorious gospel of truth, put their trust in Christ alone, be saved, and join in fellowship and membership with your local body of believers. We ask that you would raise up more officers in the church, that you would raise up more ministers to proclaim the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Our Father, we ask for this church in particular that you would be with all of our children, even all the children that are gathered here, those children, uh, most of whom, perhaps all of whom, have been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you, O Lord, would preserve these children, that you would perfect their baptisms even to the time when they will stand before this church and before the world and declare Christ as their own. We ask, O Lord, that not one child would be lost to the world, but that all, O Lord, would come in the fullness of their days and in the fullness of time, as you would call them, from this life to the life to come, that each child might be in glory with you where you are. Our Father, we ask that you would bless them in their schooling, that they might learn much and learn well and labor well for the glory of God, that you would cause the children to honor their parents, for this is right and good in your sight. O Lord, our God, we pray for those that are older, for our singles, O Lord, that you would that you would bless them in their singleness, that you would grant to those who desire spouses a spouse, that they might serve you together in that marriage union. We ask, O Lord, that you would cause the singles to be, to be pure and filled with all prayer and service in your church. O Lord, we pray for, for married couples, for wives, that they would submit themselves to their own husbands, that they would delight themselves in their labors that you have given them, O oh Lord, we ask that you would, that you would cast out all of the, the, the lies and the deceits of the world that seek to turn your word upside down concerning the relationship of husband and wife, and that you would cause wives to delight themselves in, in the, the gifts and the callings that you have given them and the duties. May their labors never seem burdensome, but may you give them much joy as they do it all for the Lord. We ask, O oh Lord, for our husbands, that you would cause the husbands to lead their families well, to love their wives, even as Christ loved the church, to be willing always to lay down their life for their wife and for their children, that they might lead their families well in the word of God around the family altar, reading and singing your praises and teaching the children the way that they should go when they are older, that they might not depart from the words of your mouth. O oh Lord, we pray for those that are older and, and some now who are widows and widowers, and we ask, Lord, that you would abide with them, that you might be their strength even as bodies grow weary over time, that you might be their strength even as some are gathered today over, uh, over YouTube this morning because of infirmities. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would heal them, that you would give them great joy in the Lord no matter the state of their physical being. For you are the one, O oh God, who strengthens your people and keeps them and abides with us and carries us, not only from birth, not only from the womb and through the strength of the years of our life, but even to old age and to whore hairs. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would show that powerfully among our church. O oh Lord, we pray for the many needs of our church. There are many that are sick, and we do ask that you would heal them. There are many, O oh Lord, that are burdened with many things that we might not know, but you know, O oh Lord, and we ask that you would cause their burdens to be cast upon you. There are many, O oh Lord, that feel that they are straying from the faith, perhaps, and we ask, Lord, that you would be with those that are straying and draw them back. We ask, Lord, that you would be with those that have great legal burdens upon them, and we think of our brother Estefanos this morning in particular, who has this urgent deadline with the court. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would give him favor in the eyes of our court system, that they might overturn their ruling, that they might allow Estefanos to stay here with us in this place, that he might continue to worship your name among your people here in Atlanta. O oh Lord, hear the cries of your people and work wonderfully beyond what we can hope or imagine among ourselves. Our Father, we ask that you would bless the ministries of this church, that you would first and foremost Bless the preaching of the word that goes out each Lord's Day morning and evening, that all might attend to it with diligence, that we might attend to your word with faith and love, laying it up in our hearts, practicing in our lives, telling our friends and our neighbors and our loved ones the glorious things that God has done for us and in us. 
Oh Lord, we ask that you would please cause many from around our communities to, to come into this church and that you would seek the lost and that they might be saved through the preaching of the word. We pray for our Bible studies, the women's fellowship, the, the work of Pastor Malaku in Clarkston as he evangelizes the many refugees and countries that are gathered there. We pray, O oh Lord, for the pro-life ministry that you would bring not only many children away from the slaughter, but to live, but that you would also bring many parents to salvation and even to this church as you have done in months past. O oh Lord, we ask that you would end all of our national sins, that you would lead us to repentance, and may this church be a faithful testimony to the watching world around us. O oh Lord, we also pray for those among us that mourn, that mourn the loss of loved ones, that mourn great trials and grievances in their lives. And we ask, O oh Lord, as you are the Lord and God of comfort, that you would comfort them with that peace that passes all understanding, that you would keep them abiding in you, and that your precious promises would be new every morning and your faithfulness every night. Oh, our Father, we ask that you would preserve each one gathered here today until that great day of your coming, O oh Lord. And so towards that end, we ask that you, our Savior, would come quickly, that you would cause us to watch and to pray and to be on guard and to labor well in your kingdom until that great day that the heavens are opened and the Son of God, even Jesus Christ, descends with power and glory to bring his people to himself. Until that great day of the Lord, we ask that you would protect, keep, bless, and sanctify your people, even from this time and forevermore. And we pray all of these things now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us in his word when we pray to say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare for the Word of God to be read and preached, our hymn of preparation will be hymn number 145, and please stand to sing if you are able. Hymn 145. Thank God for his holy word. Thank God for his holy worship. 
Let's turn this morning in God's Word to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. The book of Romans is written by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle has a desire to go to Rome to see the saints and to serve them. But he hasn't got there yet. And he desires to go there and he tells us that one of his desires is that they would help him so that he might continue on his missionary trip to Spain. And the Lord answers his prayer, but not the way he thought. He arrives some years later to Rome in chains. But this morning, we come to chapter 8 of Romans And our text is going to be verses 26 and 27. But let's start our reading at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to a futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But If we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit himself helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because... The Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Amen. The grass withers and the flowers of the field, they all perish. But the word of our God, it endures forever. And this is God's word. Let's pray. Oh, blessed God, we come to you and we acknowledge this morning that we are in your glorious presence. And we thank you, Lord, that you have become our Father through faith in Christ Jesus. And that we now, as we have done, we cry out to you, our Father. And we pray now that as your children, we would be taught by you. That you would encourage us by your word and through your spirit. And that we might know our Lord Jesus Christ is present with us. That he is here by his spirit and his word. And so, do speak to us, Lord, for your servants are listening. And bring glory to your great name. Amen. Please be seated. We thank God for his, the privilege to worship and for our uh, presbytery. I want to thank you in the session for your kind invite and also for loaning your pastor. He's been a great um, boon to us wonderful encouragement to the saints at the former Providence, now Lake Brant Reformed Church. But thank, thanks for your wonderful invitation. The eighth chapter of Romans is a glorious, a glorious passage of assurance. Verse 1 begins with that great declaration where the Apostle Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
And when the Apostle Paul uses that word now in Romans, he is speaking of the new epoch, the new era that has dawned upon the church, the era of the Spirit of Christ Jesus. And the Apostle then, he begins with the work of Christ, all that he has done for us, securing our salvation. But then as you continue on in Romans 8, you notice that there's a lot of talk of the Spirit of Christ. And that's because what the Apostle does next is he, he speaks about the One, the third person of the Trinity, who now applies the work that Christ Jesus has accomplished to the hearts and the lives of the children of God. He indwells us so that we might know that we are the children of God. His witness, with our witness, testifies that we truly are His children, dear children of the living God. And with marvel, you remember how the Apostle John says, and so we are, and so we are. And furthermore, not only does he indwell us, not only does he enable us to put sin to death, he says that we are heirs of God and co-heirs, fellow heirs, with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now you see all the glorious realities of who we are in Christ, that we actually share, that our Lord Jesus, he shares his inheritance with us. That's amazing, but he does. This is the generosity of our God in Christ Jesus. But we see that already from the Father, sending his Son, giving us his very best, his Son and then his Spirit, so that we might know the blessedness of life in Christ. But notice then, at the end of verse 17, where the apostle says we are heirs of the God and fellow heirs with Christ Jesus, he says, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And so there's our union with our Lord Jesus Christ. We, we like our Lord, the cross and then the crown, we suffer with him and we shall be glorified with him. But the Apostle Paul says, don't be over-concerned about the suffering of this present evil age. Why? Verse 18, he says, For I consider, having written 1 Corinthians 11, where he speaks of all the sufferings that he endured for the sake of the gospel, Paul says, I've considered these things. And he says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us and in us. It's not even a match. It's not even close. It's not on, even on the same level, the Apostle Paul says. And we ought to think, as he says in Corinthians, that these are just momentary afflictions. Afflictions, yes. Suffering, yes. But when we put it in the scope of life, in the reality of life, they're nothing. They're less than dust on a scale, Paul says. They're not to be even compared. But it's not like the apostle sticks his head in the sand and say, well, don't worry about it at all. No, in the rest of the chapter then, he helps us like a good pastor. He then takes the truth of God's word and he applies it to the lives of God's children. And that's what he does in verses 19 through the end of the chapter actually. We shall notice in verses 19 through 22 that we read, Paul tells us the whole creation actually was subjected to bondage and corruption. They are groaning. The creation around us, they're groaning. It's groaning. But the good thing, the great thing is, it's not growing in, in the throes of death. Rather, it is groaning in anticipation of being made new. The new heavens and the new earth. 
It's glorious. Yes, there's pain. There's groaning. You see it in hurricanes and earthquakes and all sorts of disaster. But the Apostle Paul says God subjected it to such bondage in hope of the new age, the new glorious heaven and earth where we shall and it shall enjoy the fullness of rule under the servants of Christ. So creation is craning its neck. That's the language here, longing for that day of restoration. But then within the groaning of creation, there's a groaning church. That's what Paul says here in verse 22. We groan. We groan in as believers. We groan in our spirits. We groan because of the suffering that we endure. The church is groaning. And, but notice what Paul says. We groan inwardly, 23, as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons. Are we adopted as children of God? Yes. But not, we don't realize the fullness of that adoption yet. And Paul says, yes, we are groaning. We can't wait. And yet we must patiently wait for that glorious day. The consummation, the full reality of our adoption and the redemption of our bodies. But now, in verse 26 and verse 27, the apostle speaks here of a third groaning. So we have the groaning of creation, and there is the groaning of the church. But here's the great part. Now we have the groaning of the Spirit. The Spirit. There is this wordless groaning of the Spirit of God on behalf of the saints. And Paul's helping us here to understand then that if the groaning of the Spirit of Christ is being heard, then surely the groaning of the creation and the groaning of the church will also be heard. We will assuredly be answered. Yes, we may be sure, Paul is saying, that the future glory far outweighs the pain of present suffering. For, he says, in this hope we are saved. In this hope we are saved. This is part of the reality of the Christian and the Christian life. So this morning, let's consider two things. Very, very simply, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in helping believers. And then secondly, an illustration of how the Spirit helps believers. And that is in our prayer life. So first, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in helping believers. And then second, the illustration of the Holy Spirit in helping believers, particularly in our prayer life. The Apostle tells us in verse 26, he said, Likewise, that is, in the same manner, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Now, one of the great blessings we enjoy and the benefit that we have is to know that the Spirit's ministry in our lives is sustaining us. The Spirit indwelling us is the one who encourages us, who refreshes us, who enables us to live the Christian life. That is what God has given us his spirit for, so that we might be sanctified. And as he does that, he prepares us for glory. But you notice what the apostle says, that the spirit helps us in our weakness. In our weakness. Now he's not specific here. Rather, it's a general statement that is true of every Christian and all Christians. We are weak. We cannot stand on our own. We need God's enabling grace by the power of his Holy Spirit. We're feeble. We're frail. We're fragile. 
And there's so much that comes against us day in and day out that seeks to overthrow us and overwhelm us, quite frankly. We have weaknesses because we exist in this fallen world. Paul's just spoken of that. The creation groans. We groan because we live in this world. We live in a world of sin, and, and sin still indwells us. Oh yes, chapter 6 is true, that we have died to sin, we've died to the law, and that sin no longer has dominion over us, that is true. We have a new master, praise God, Jesus Christ, but the remnant of sin is still very present and will be to the last breath. And so there's always this battle for holiness in our lives. It's not easy. And God knows we can't live the Christian life alone. We would fail. But notice what Paul says. In the midst of our weakness, there's someone who helps us. There's a helper. And that person is the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of God. Now, this is the most comforting and reassuring truth, isn't it? We often find ourselves so weak, so impoverished, in situations that we just don't know what to do. We, we are at the end of the road, and we don't know which way to turn. We're, we're, we don't know. We're perplexed. We agonize over something. We can't find a solution. And the Apostle Paul says, there's someone who can help us in our weakness. Not can, does help us in our weakness. There's someone, the Spirit of Christ. Someone who doesn't despise us because of our weakness, but he comes alongside us. To help us. Now you wouldn't know it from our English translations. It, it doesn't matter if you have the ESV or other translations, but there's a, this word help is crucial to understand the full import of it. It's not just a simple word, it's a compound word. For we, or likewise the Spirit helps us, verse 26, in our weakness. The Greek word that's translated here is actually made up of three words. The first word means with. The second prefix means over against. And then the verb that we have here is, carries the idea of taking hold of something. So putting it all together, we get the sense that the Holy Spirit is someone who takes hold of something as he stands over against us, but is with us. That's difficult, isn't it, in some sense to understand. Let me illustrate. When our family lived in, back in Canada, up in Canada, Ontario, one of the places we enjoyed going was to this farmer's market. It was the St. Jacob's Farmer's Market. And we usually went in the fall when all the produce was being harvested and, and we'd have all these lovely booths with all sorts of vegetables and fruits. Many of the contributors to that market were of Mennonite background and they had surrounded that market with all these farms. So they, they came there, and it was a wonderful place where they could sell their produce. Now, one of the booths that we enjoyed going to as a family was the apple cider booth, because they were really a precursor to Costco. They'd give you a little sample in hopes that you would purchase their cider. But on one occasion, at the end of the day, I noticed, as we were actually walking to our vehicle, I noticed that there was this Mennonite uh, man 
who had a difficulty lifting his basket of apples or his bushet basket of apples back onto the wagon. And, um, and he was struggling. He tried a number of times, but he just couldn't get it. Apparently, he didn't sell out all his apples. And so I quickly walked over to the gentleman, grabbed the other wire of that basket. If some of you know those woven baskets with the, the wood, and, and they had a wire handle. Well, he grabbed one handle, I grabbed the other handle, and together we put it on his wagon. But then I realized his weakness. Amos only had one arm. And he was trying to get that basket on, but he couldn't. He knows my wife and my children in tow, and he offered us a horse and buggy ride. Um, and that was the beginning of a new friendship and a new tradition. Every time we go to St. We would always visit Amos and Aunt Sarah, and he would always offer a buggy ride to our family through the country roads. But this is what the Spirit does. He notices our weakness. He notices it. And then he grabs hold, as it were, of the situation together with us. We on one side, he on the other side. Now, it's very important, it's very important to understand that the Spirit doesn't tell us just to get out of the way and I'll do it by myself. You know, sometimes when you help people move, you, we, you have these husky, strong men, bodybuilders, and they want to show a little bit of their strength. Something like, remember Jacob at the well when he moved that stone for the, for the uh, herds to drink? He did it all by himself. That's not how the Spirit works. No, the Spirit works with us. He carries it along with us. We're not robots. It's not that we're not involved. No, we are. He is working with us. He's carrying it with us. And not only that, that while he's carrying it with us, we're on the other end and he's sustaining us as we carry it too. You see, he carries our burdens with us. And that's Paul's point here. That whatever your weakness might be, whatever frailty of mind or heart or soul, whatever it might be, the Spirit of God notices. He notices. And he comes alongside with you and he bears that burden of yours. And he carries it with you in tandem. You know how often in the Christian life you say to yourself, I just can't handle it anymore. Whatever it might be, whatever struggle, whatever burden, whatever cross the Lord would have us bear, we say, we just can't handle it. Sometimes someone has been derided or spoken ill of or unkindly against, and you're feeling discouraged, you're feeling downcast, and the Spirit notices, and He lovingly comes alongside you, and He bears our burdens, He sustains us with His grace. His ministry is, to us is so, so precious, is so gracious that He sees us in our weakness, and his great ministry is to encourage us, to uphold us as he lifts the heavy end, as it were, so that we might continue the life of faith. And you know what's so beautiful about the Spirit of Christ? That when he notices our weakness, he doesn't despise us. He doesn't despise us but rather he seeks out those who are weak, those who are discouraged and distressed, and he comes 
and bears the burden with us. That's how precious of a spirit he is. And that's why we can see why Scripture speaks of him as the Spirit of Christ, who does not snuff out a dimly burning wick or break a bruised reed. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit helping us in our weakness. But then, the Apostle gives us an illustration of how the Spirit does that in our prayer life. And he tells us, he says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Now, this is a weakness most, most Christians have, isn't it? Prayer. Prayer. Verse 26, he says, For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings, too deep for works. Now, you know what's remarkable about this illustration? Is that prayer itself is an act of weakness. Why do we pray? We pray as we just acknowledge, Yuri, because because we show our dependence dependence upon the Lord. We need the Lord. If we could do it ourselves, we wouldn't pray, but we do need help, and so we pray. In intercessory prayer, we acknowledge that we need help, that we can't do it alone. We can't go alone. But we pray, Lord, you can help us. You can carry my burden. You can bring healing. You are the God who is able. But sometimes we don't know what to pray and even how to pray. On multiple occasions, When my wife and I go out to visit members of the church or different family or friends who are in need, we we see the need and we're overcome with them by the affliction and it's so difficult. And as, as we get closer to the home, I often say, I don't know what to pray. I don't know how to pray. What do I say? It's so difficult. It's such an incredibly perplexing situation. Have you ever been in a situation where you don't know what to say? You just don't know what to say. It's not that you don't want to pray. You want to pray, but but you don't know what to say. You don't know how to say it. You know you need to pray. But because of the ignorance, there is an incoherence. It's perplexing. We just don't know what to say. We love to pray. We know we ought to pray. But we don't know our way around. We're confused so often. And, and our confusion then leaves us speechless. Speechless. Or in an instant, our world can be turned upside down. And, and you need, you know you need the Lord's help, but, but you can't articulate the words. It goes so deep. And all it seems you can do is weep. And weep. And weep. The Apostle Paul says that when we're in such a situation, something amazing happens. We do not know how to pray as we ought to pray, but here comes the precious Holy Spirit, Paul says. He himself intercedes for you. That's his ministry, his blessed ministry to the children of God. He sees you in your weakness. And he prays. He prays. He intercedes on your behalf. Now most of us know that we have an intercessor with God. Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God. And as as the apostle says, he always intercedes for us. 
But what the Apostle Paul is saying to us now is that the Spirit himself is not in heaven, as it were, interceding for us. No, he is within us interceding for us. His ministry comes from within us. What a beautiful thing. It's a mysterious for sure. But when we're overwhelmed, when we're speechless, we are still prayed for. Our needs are brought before the throne of grace and mercy. And God hears us because the Spirit is our intercessor. But even more profound than that, Paul says that our Heavenly Father sees into the deep things of my heart. Look at verse 27. And he who searches hearts, that's, that's God who searches hearts, he knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for saints according to the will of God. God searches my heart. Now, that can be a frightening thing. God searching our hearts, it can be a frightening thing, you might say. We don't want others searching our hearts. I don't want you searching my heart. We don't want that, do we? But the beautiful thing, the wonderful thing is that that God does search my heart. Yes, he sees my sin. He sees, he knows all about me. He sees my iniquity. But you know what? Our God, who is our loving Heavenly Father, He cares for us. And He is so gracious that He doesn't blast me for my sin because He cares. He cares. He helps me. He loves me. And He searches my heart and He knows my longings deep inside of my heart. He knows my needs, my weaknesses, my, the, my expressions of, of confusion and, and perplexity. All the things that we think about and we can't figure out. But at the same time, the Apostle Paul says, while the Father is searching my heart, he hears the intercession of the blessed Holy Spirit from within our hearts. And when the Holy Spirit then prays for the saints, it's in perfect agreement with God the Father. It's always according to the will of God because the Holy Spirit is God. And so that as the Spirit intercedes for us below within us, and as Jesus Christ intercedes for us in heaven, both according to the will of God. The result is that your need, whatever it might be, you will receive from your Heavenly Father who always hears the prayers of His Son and of His Holy Spirit. Now, you still might be wondering, how does this really work? How does the Spirit intercede for me? Well, surely the mystery, there's mystery here. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is is surely clothed in mystery. And we see that all through the scriptures. That our Lord Jesus Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary. And on and on. Regeneration is a work of the Spirit taking that which is dead and making us alive in Christ. But how does he do? Well, Jesus says, you can see the wind, it's moving, you know he's working. And so it is here. How how does the Spirit do his great work? Well, remember. Remember the explanation of the word help from verse 26. And we'll get to understand a little bit more of the how the Spirit works in his ministry in us. 
It's not like his ministry is, is, is like the, a substitute prayer. You know, you had substitute teachers when you went to school. Your teacher was sick. You had a sub. No, that's not how it is. We're not just channels so that the Spirit is the one and only the one who is praying. And we do not have any involvement. Not at all. No, the Spirit helps us as he comes alongside of us and within us. He's working. He sees our weakness. And it seems that Paul is saying the Spirit is mysteriously working in us so that, that the only thing, the only thing we feel we can do is groan and sigh with expressions of our heart. The Holy Spirit understands and he takes those groanings, those sighings of our hearts and he presents our intercession to our loving Father. I had an uncle who was dumb. That is, he couldn't speak. He couldn't speak. And when I was a boy, or rather when he was a boy, his father took him to the Toronto Children's Hospital, but they couldn't help him. After a little while, they sent him home. They just couldn't help him. And as a little boy, as our, my parents would go and visit their parents, my grandparents, and I would visit my grandfather, whom we affectionately called Opa. I remember being a bit afraid, actually, sitting at the kitchen table, which was the place that we always conversed, sitting at the kitchen table as a little boy. And I was afraid because of all these strange noises, the groanings that my uncle would make. But there was something else I remember. There's something else I never forgot. That when my uncle would make what to me seemed strange noises, unintelligible grunts and, and, and sighs, somehow my opa would understand. And he'd be able to interpret and he would be able to calm his son. And his son would be at peace. He knew exactly what he was saying or what he needed. He provided for him exactly, it seemed, what was called for. When my uncle passed away at an early age, his pastor preached his funeral sermon from Psalm 103. Verses 13 and 14. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. And then these words. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And as by that time, a young teenager, maybe just a teenager, sitting there listening to that sermon. And, and multiple times since that, I often thought how appropriate, how absolutely appropriate this text was. My opa was a compassionate, loving father to his children. And the Lord, the Lord is so much more compassionate, so much more loving to his dear children. And the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.17, Now the Lord is the Spirit. You see, that's what the Apostle is saying here. Sometimes we're so overwhelmed with our situation, so grieved or confused, we don't, we don't know what to say. We don't know how to pray. 
And somehow, by the mysterious working of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity who loves us, who's so compassionate towards us, who indwells us, he intercedes for us with words, with groanings rather too deep for words. And when he prays for the grace that we need, we receive it from the hands of our gracious, loving Father. Now, Scripture gives us several examples of such wordless prayers. Asaph, in Psalm 77, verses 1 and 2, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble I seek the Lord. In the night my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. What's wrong? Asaph, what's going on? I don't know. I don't know. But but I can't sleep. All I can do is moan and, and groan. My spirit is fainting within me. Or consider the passage we read this morning from Isaiah. The poem that Hezekiah wrote in Isaiah 38 when the to- prophet told them about his imminent death. He says in verse 14, like a swallow or a crane, I chirp, I moan like a dove. My eyes are weary and looking upward. O Lord, I am oppressed. Be my pledge for safety. What shall I say? For he's spoken to me, and he himself has done it. I will slowly walk slowly all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. Or how about the Apostle Peter? After he denied our Lord Jesus Christ three times. And you remember that moving scene that Luke tells us in the courtyard of Cephas that when our when the Apostle Peter, when he denied his Lord Jesus on the third time, Luke tells us that our Lord's eyes looked right at Peter. They locked, as it were. And then Luke tells us he went out and wept. Bitterly. Peter was deeply convicted of what he has done. Now Luke doesn't record for us a prayer of contrition like Psalm 51. All we hear are his groanings. All we see are his tears running down his face. Because he was so overwhelmed with his grief. He was so burdened by his failure to be what he promised our Lord. That he would be and that he ought to be as a, as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who now even was going to the cross for sinners. He was so overwhelmed. There are no words. But that's not to say there was no prayer. No, we can be sure. We can be sure that there was a prayer. Why? The blessed Spirit's intercession 
for Peter. There was a prayer arising to heaven from within Peter, from his soul, coming down from the depths of his heart. Oh God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Pardon me for Christ's sake. And who can forget that moving scene, one of the most moving scenes in all of Scripture that the evangelists record for us of our beloved Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane when he realized for the first time the fullest extent of what it meant for him being the son of Mary to go and die on the cross, to be, in the words of Isaiah, to be a sheep led to the slaughter. And how the evangelists speak of the anguish of his soul, that he was sweating blood to show us that he was sorrowful even unto death. And then how he pleaded Three times, not once, not twice, but three times that his disciples would pray, that they would pray with him, that they would intercede to the Father on his behalf. But his three closest friends failed him. They fell asleep. In the anguish of our Savior's soul, these human intercessors failed. But you can be sure that our Lord Jesus did have a prayer partner. The Holy Spirit was his prayer partner, interceding for Jesus right at that time, according to the will of God. How do we know? Well, he was heard. And he cried out, Abba, Father. He was in the midst of the greatest struggle of his life. And he prayed, Abba, Father, all things are possible with you. All things. Remove the cup from me. I can't fathom it. Remove that cup from me. And yet not my will, but yours be done. My dear friends, the Lord Jesus Christ, he went to the cross so that you might have his blessed spirit. That same Holy Spirit that was the prayer partner for our Savior, for Peter, is our prayer partner. He is the one that Christ has blessed the church with us so that when there are situations in your life, perhaps a telephone call that changes your life completely because of some tragic event, some accident, you're so confused, you're so perplexed with the providences of God, or perhaps you've fallen into sin. You can only think that your life is over. What good am I? I'm a complete failure. There's no hope. And all you can do is groan and you can weep. The Apostle Paul says, dear child, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged because you have a prayer partner. You have a prayer partner. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is interceding for you. He is bringing those words, those wordless groanings and grunts and sighs of your soul. And they're ascending to the throne of grace and mercy. And so be of good cheer, brothers and sisters. Be of good cheer. Christ is praying for you above. The Spirit of Christ is praying for you within your heart. And the Father who always hears the prayers of His Son and Spirit will graciously give you all things. He will graciously give you what you need. He will.
because he always heals the Spirit and the Son. And so, as we journey through this life, in a world that is groaning, in the church that is groaning, with all the sadnesses and the disappointments, the perplexities, the tragedies. Yes, we wait eagerly. And we wait patiently, but with expectation for the adoption, the full adoption as sons, the fullness of God's redemption for you, glorified bodies and souls. You might know that you don't travel alone. The Holy Spirit himself is in you to sustain you, to supply all your needs and your weakness, and to bring you to glory. He will, and he does, because the Father always hears him. Amen. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for the particular care and kindness that you have shown towards us, that you are a God who does not use our weakness against us, but you pity us. You have compassion upon us. You send your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, to dwell within us, to come alongside us, to take hold of our situation, to sustain us so that we might take hold of the situation as well and to give us all that we need according to your riches and glory in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the reassurance of your word and the encouragement that it gives to us and how it refreshes our spirits as we travel to that heavenly home where our citizenship is. We pray this in the name of our blessed and loving Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who has given us his own Holy Spirit. Amen. Congregation, let us respond. Let's rise and sing together selection 394. 394. This day at thy creating word. 394. This day. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, look up. 
Receive the blessing of your God as you go forth. This week, the world bring witness to him. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our heavenly, benevolent, gracious Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, who is our enabler, be with you this day. And until the day breaks and all shadows flee away, and then glory forever in Emmanuel's land. Amen. Thank you for joining us online today. We believe the Bible to be the true and inerrant Word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice. With a priority upon corporate worship, we also believe that we glorify God by worshiping Him according to the principles of Scripture and not the traditions of man. Come, join us at Redeemer as we rejoice in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.